I got an idea, he said in a more like a thinking to himself tone. He pulled the G-Wagon to a stop. I don't know what he was thinking, but we were still surrounded by pitch black. He opened his car door and got out. Stay right there, he commanded me. I wasn't going anywhere without him anyway, and as far as I know, there is nowhere to go. I was still tight because the teenage bitch's voice was revolving in my mind. For some bullshit reason, I couldn't push it out. Funny you should mention mama. Funny you should mention mama. Funny you should mention mama. Her words and her voice were on a loop in my head. Bomber bitch was forcing me into a deep thought when in fact I think that dead or alive, there are subjects and topics and things that a person should never have to think about. A dead person should be dead and without thoughts. I am dead and thinking about precisely the things that I never want to think about. Bet all of the assholes who committed suicide were shocked and angry as hell when they found out that dead is not dead. And they would be the same person after death with the same thoughts that they had thought they were ending, getting rid of, silencing. Now mama was dead center in my mental line of vision. In that freeze frame, she was Brooklyn mama before the move to our luxurious Long Island mansion. Before some nigga who was jelly shot her in her face and permanently altered her perfect look. But most importantly, the picture of mama in my mind was before she ever toked a hit of that crack pipe. I knew, after having 15 years on lock, to just sit and think about it. That for me to accept my mother, a.k.a. mama, a.k.a. Lana Santiago, a.k.a. the baddest bitch on the planet, after her crack breakdown would be the same as rejecting myself. No. It would be the same as destroying myself. Brooklyn Mama was the voice in my head. She was the image in my eyes, my pattern, my fabric, my fashion. She was all of the ingredients mixed together that made me, me. Mama was the most. She was the beautifulest, the livest, the baddest, the funniest, the finest, everything. I didn't need no books. Mama was all show and tell. She told me and showed me while she was telling me all that a bitch needs to know. Ooh, now, that's not cool, she would say when I shitted in my diaper at age two. That's how way back my earliest memory of mama goes. It is my first and earliest memory of anyone or anything, including myself. After mama said that, she taught me how to pee and poop, where to pee and poop, and how to clean myself thoroughly and smell like a lady always should smell. Come in the bathroom, she would wave me in. Always close the door while you do your private business. And remember, your private business and your business, business, both ain't nobody else's business. She would talk to me like I was an adult and then laugh at herself. But I knew she meant it and I understood her perfectly. No potty, she would say, kicking the baby toilet into a corner. Sit on the real seat like I do, she would say, pointing. I would be trying my best to balance my little body on the adult toilet with the humongous hole. Now tinkle, she would say, like it was a magical thing, not just pissing in the bowl. While I tinkled, Mama would turn away and look at herself in the bathroom mirror while singing a song which relaxed me. Mama had the dopest music collection of original singles and albums. She knew every song ever made from the oldest to the newest. In my first memory, she was singing All I Need, an old joint that she loved. She was doing Marvin Gaye's part in Tammy Terrell's twisting and turning her body while fixed on her own reflection. She was singing so passionately, I wondered, is she singing to Papa or is she singing to me or is she singing to herself? After that first memory, I remember Mama singing Everybody is a Star to me in the scented bubble bath as we bathed at the same time in the same tub. Mama was musical and Papa had the whole house wired with speakers in every room, including the kitchen and the bathroom, so that Mama could be happy at home. All fresh and clean, Mama is carrying me, wrapped in the thickest, softest white terry cloth towel to her bedroom. Both of us sitting on her king-sized bed, Mama will oil and powder and dress me. She'd comb through my silky hair like each strand was a thread of pure gold. All good. She would leap up and rush into her clothing closet, to the top shelf where she kept her collection of eye catchers, showstoppers, high fashion hats. She would carefully select one and put it on my little head, drowning me in it. Tilt it like this, lay it to the side, she would cheer, 
as my little fingers attempted to adjust the hat to the style that was the only way a fashionable superstar like Mama would approve. Soon as I caught the right angle, Mama would be clicking her Kodak or pressing out Polaroids of me that would end up on her wall of photos of everything Mama loved the most. That was us, family. By the time I was six, Mama would play dress me in her real clothes with real bitch accessories so that I could walk down the runway that Mama made in the apartment corridor, which she lit up with colorful lamps and lights. I'd be killing the red carpet while the overhead speakers would be pouring out the sounds of Rod Stewart's Do You Think I'm Sexy? I worked the runway to all Mama's music picks, which could be anything because she knew everything musical. Donna Summers, Hot Stuff, Grace Jones, La Vie and Rose, or Slave to the Rhythm. Mama loved Grace Jones. Mama loved anyone and everything that she loved to the fullest. She was the loyalest woman on earth to anything or anyone who she chose. Mama marked time and her favorite memories through music. She loved to tell me her coming up stories. When she would be narrating them to me, it seemed she was more excited hearing the story she was telling, even though she knew them already and had told them to me or Papa more than once before. She never sat still when she was saying her stories. She was all movement, demonstrating, gesturing, and reenacting. She told me I was born a product of two songs. Betty writes, Tonight is the Night. She wouldn't sing the whole song, just certain lines to highlight and prove that this song was her story. Mama said Betty Wright's song was the soundtrack to her 14 years young, first love, first intimacy, first sexual experience with the one and only Papa. She'd be acting like she could fear herself giving up her virginity right while she was telling the story. She squeezed her eyes tight in anticipation, clamped her legs together like she was really nervous, and even had sound effects like ooh and woo and oh yeah. The other record that made me happen, according to Mama, was Rod Stewart's Tonight the Night. Because he was cool, sexy, and smooth. And only Santiago was sexier, smoother, and cooler than Rod without having to sing one note. Mama had more style, got more looks, and had more wigs than the Supremes. She could rock it long and silky to the back of her thighs or wear blunt cuts, short beautiful bobs, or her own hair in swirls of finger waves. She threw me big birthday parties, which could not be called just parties because they were major events that niggas from BK to BX fought to get invited to. Many of the people who showed up I did not even know, even though the celebration was for me. After the huge crowd went home, when only family remained gathered in the ballroom, Mama would emerge, dressed up on some karaoke-type vibe. She'd be Tina Turner and somehow lured Papa into dressing like he was Ike. He didn't sing, though. He just laid back and let Mama mesmerize him with her high energy and vibrant personality. No matter how she freaked it, Mama was larger than life and glowed more than any worldwide superstar. That's right. Mama taught me how to talk by always talking to me and singing to me. Come to think of it, hip-hop was Mama remixed, sampled, looped, slowed down, and sped up with a dope-ass beat beneath it. Mama is the reason why I love hip-hop. Memorized it like I memorized Mama and moved my hips to it. Up until this day, dead or alive. Mama taught me how to walk, whether it was on her homemade runway, up and down the project steps, or on the stoops, cement streets, or curbs. Mama taught me how to stand, style, and strike a pose. Mama taught me body and style language, how to talk without ever saying a word, how to capture and wear the prettiest, most stylish, meanest fashions so I would never have to tell the next bitch anything. She would just stay the fuck back or back the fuck off because she knew beside me is not where she belonged. Mama taught me how to choose friends and be so badass that they would choose to bow down to my look without me asking or having to be snobby or shitty about it. What to share and not to share. What to give away and never accept back. What to keep and never allow anyone to touch, beg for, or borrow. Mama ranked and ruled everything, even her own real-life sisters who were my aunts. She didn't say so-and-so is number one and this one is number two or anything like that, but I could see Mama's words through her actions. Barbara, a.k.a. Aunt B, was her oldest sister. Mama had her babysit me from time to time. Aunt Barbara was appointed and paid to be babysitter to all of the family's kids, even though she hated children. 
The fact that we all could feel that Aunt Barbara didn't want to watch even her own kids was proof that Mama, even though she was the youngest sister of her family, was boss. Barbara did what Mama asked her to do. My Aunt Lori cooked the dinner meals for Mama. Mama would speed down the hall to her apartment, pick up the prepared foods, run back, set the table at our place, and pretend like she cooked everything herself. Aunt Lori knew better than to mention it, and she never did. Me and Papa knew the deal, of course, and so did Mama, really. But we went along with it because Mama was so cute in all of her ways. Mama's sister, Lila, got down on her knees and scrubbed our toilets and bathtub. She was our Brooklyn Project apartment housekeeper. She waxed our floors on her knees without a mop. She vacuumed the carpeted floors, and she made our beds and did dishes and windows. In addition to paying her sisters, Mama treated them to spas and clubs, hair salons, concerts, sports events, and parties and Broadway shows, places they could never have afforded on their own dollar. Mama's brothers all worked for Papa. Mama made Papa commander over them. Usually, men don't like that type of thing. But for baby sister Lana, who kinged and hooked the hottest hustler, everybody would do it her way because she was her. Besides, Papa made them capable, decent, and most importantly, hood wealthy. All of my cousins, my same age and of course older, kissed my ass because I was Lana's golden child. So I learned how to rank everything and put everyone and everything in its proper place where it belonged, beneath me. By 13, I was 9 millimeter dangerous, and I knew it. I didn't need no more instructions, homemade runways, or private concerts. I had watched and listened to and loved Mama so much. I was Mama, the young version. And because I was naturally a Mama-Papa combo, I was considered an upgraded version, a limited edition of Mama. Papa gave me that light skin and long black wavy hair look and pretty eyes with the long lashes that I didn't have to buy from the cosmetics counter or wigs or weaves from the hair store. Still, deep brown, flawless skinned, brick house body, long legged, forever young face, sultry mama topped all, any and everyone, everywhere we went. I would see boys to men of all ages, eyes dancing back and forth, up, down, and all around as they tried to choose between us. For me, mama was the queen and obvious best. My most luxurious, stylish, lovely one. She was hands down my most incredible possession, and mama was my mirror. It was great becoming best friends with mama, having someone in your teen young years who is not trying to stop you from living, feeling, running wild a little bit, just for the experience and for the hell of it, is diamond class. She wouldn't expect anything stupid that other parents expected, like for me to be all in love with and enslaved to going to school earning stupid-ass best attendance awards, or even getting good grades and studying. We had plenty paper. Papa earned it. We spent it. We had no reason to take the long bullshit route that lower-ranked, less-prepared families and people had to take. We weren't mad or mean to any of those people. Many of them were our friends, neighbors, family, and workers. Besides, like I said, they bowed down voluntarily. Brooklyn Mama would smoke a blunt, and might sneak some lines of cocaine while running with her sisters. She would throw back a glass or two of champagne at our huge events, parties, and celebrations. Still, she could be overheard reminding all in our close family circle. Crack makes us rich. Crack makes them crackheads. Then she would laugh her laugh that would trigger anybody listening to laugh along with her. Seriously, though, she would say while they were still laughing, and she has switched her mood. Crack is whack. Don't let it bring you down. Mama used to tell me when choosing my friends not to choose the children of the customers because customers are crackheads who can never, ever be trusted. Besides, they are beneath us and they don't get the privilege to come into our family circle, apartments, or our luxurious world. Crackhead Mama erased Brooklyn Mama, the phenom, who I thought would shine and live forever. Crackhead Mama caused Brooklyn Mama to drop down through all of the ranks that she set up. Crackhead Mama unlocked the doors and let in all that was beneath us. The crackhead was doing every single thing that Brooklyn Mama taught and showed me a real bitch should and would never do. Mama fucked up her currency. Her currency was her look. If she was my mirror, and she was, 
and smoking crack fucked up her look, which it did, what was that supposed to do for me, to me? Seventeen and a stunner, surrounded by my Brooklyn friends I had since day one. Friends who competed with one another to be the closest to me. Friends who looked up to mama and who wished she was their mama. Friends who either never met their fathers, hated their fathers, or ain't seen that nigga in a decade, admired, sweated, and studied mama because papa wifed her, gave her everything, and stayed. Crackhead mama gave these same friends of mine, who quietly worshipped me and eagerly bowed down, the advantage and the opportunity to talk behind my back. Laugh right up in my face, step right up to my rank, and act like we was all, all of a sudden, equal. In the Santiago family, Santiago and me stayed true to the game. Even my sisters, Porsche, Lexi, and Mercedes all rebounded, landed on their feet, and kept it royal. I never ever said it out loud, but that's why I pushed Mama way to the back of my mind and deleted her from my talk, mention, and memory. And even if there is a Jana or whatever, and Mama is there in heaven, if she don't look and feel and talk and act familiar, like Brooklyn Mama, I don't need or want to see her. To see her would be to kill my own self. And I never ever been a suicidal bitch. Crackhead Mama was and is an unacceptable, complete fucking embarrassment to me.